Hi, I'm Unruly Anime. The story begins as the popular kids at school make their stuck-up walk through the hallways as everyone gossips about them. Sujun is the student council president's superstar, and some unpopular guy named Kazuki is her little sidekick who's also the vice president. Some people just turn out to be the center of attention, but our average Joe, the ordinary protagonist, doesn't consider himself one of these people. His name is Ken, and this self-hating guy just thinks of himself as a forgettable, run-of-the-mill high school student. The most exciting adventure in this dude's vanilla-flavored life is returning some dumb pigeon babies to their nest. Deep down, Ken was always hoping for an extraordinary life. Luckily for him, he is the protagonist of this anime. For now, it's raining, and Ken doesn't have an umbrella. Ken's evil side showed itself for a second as he contemplated taking someone else's, but this typical good guy decided against it, fearing the beginning of a life of crime over a $5 umbrella. This proves to be a pretty stupid decision, as he ends up waiting for hours. Sujun appears out of nowhere and explains that all students are required to leave. This guy really is forgettable, as he decides to just run home in the rain, but Sujun stops him. It would look bad for the student council to just watch him get soaked in the rain like a loser, so Kazuki arrives and lends him his spare umbrella. Ken was certain that Kazuki didn't even know of his useless existence, and was even more surprised when Kazuki seemed to be a nice guy. They offer to all walk home together, and Sujun points out that it must be fate that they met. Ken's nerdy mind goes right to video games, as he thinks of this moment as suddenly walking home with two of the most popular kids at school. He almost ruins this marvelous moment as he says that everyone in school will be jealous. But luckily they didn't hear his utterly embarrassing comment on their little walk. Ken tells Kazuka that he didn't expect him to be so nice because he only ever sees this playboy flirting with the ladies. Kazuki only talks to the girls out of pity, and Sujun roasts him by saying that he likes talking to boys better anyway. Sujun is even more unapproachable for our shy protagonist, as she is at the top of her class in all subjects and in all sports. Ken glazes her up even more and points out that she's also beautiful inside and out. Ken, acting like some kind of dumb gossip news reporter, finally comes out and asks if they are dating. Since everyone at school talks about it, the walk gets pretty awkward, but they explain that they only spend so much time together because they are on the student council. Ken apologizes for the incredibly stupid question that he definitely should not have asked, but Sujun doesn't mind since it's better than talking behind their back. Their incredibly snooze-inducing conversation continues as the three of them talk about what they will do when they graduate. None of these dummies have a plan yet. Sujun is already in her third year, but she has a huge problem. She still hasn't found what she wants to do, and she immediately completes any goal she sets for herself, seemingly foreshadowing what's about to happen. Sujun explains that she feels like she doesn't belong in this world, and Ken was shocked. The two of them are totally opposite people, but he understands that feeling. This boring conversation has me wishing that they would just kiss and get it over with. But they all stop when the two student council members hear bells ringing. The ringing gets louder and louder, but Ken doesn't hear a single thing. <laughs> just as Ken approaches the others, a magic circle appears on the ground, and he wonders if it's a gate to another world. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of being terrified, Sushun looks like a psycho and wonders if Ken thinks they will find magic, monsters, and heroes in this other world. Ken is shocked that she's into that kind of stuff, but time is up, and they are taken away. Ken eventually wakes up and finds that they are sitting in front of a king. The boys are rightfully terrified and cautious, but something is wrong with Suzune's brain, as she only feels excitement. King Lloyd has the most basic name ever and introduces himself as Lloyd. Kazuka wants to skip the introductions, and the man wants to know why Lloyd brought them there. Lloyd keeps his hot-headed guard from slicing Kazuki into pieces for his disrespect and reveals that he is king. As if that wasn't painfully obvious already, the kids are still shocked by this, except for Suzune, who is having the time of her life. 
Lloyd then reveals that they were summoned to be heroes, making all of Suzume's dreams come true. Two years ago, this world was attacked by the King of Demons and his army. They managed to drive them off, but the Demon Lord's power has been growing. As a last resort, they called forth accomplished individuals from another world who could confront the Demon Lord using a forbidden ritual known as Hero Summoning. Ken tries to remind the excited Suju that they're having a serious conversation, and Kazuki goes all crazy. He doesn't care about heroes or demon lords, and is just furious that they were summoned without consent. He refuses to join since he is not the protagonist, and he demands that they get sent back to their world. Unfortunately for this side character, the hero summoning only works in one direction, so they can't go back. Kazuka still wants to go back to flirting with all the ladies back home, but the king apologizes as they are desperate for help. Kazuki's whining marathon pushes the guards to finally quiet him down by threatening to turn him from a side character to a non-existent one. Ken calms the hot head down, and the king shockingly bows before them. He promises to find them a way back eventually, but begs that these heroes help him. In the meantime, Sujun finally stops fangirling over being a hero and wonders why the king calls them heroes without knowing anything about them. A little girl named Welchi explains that hero summoning is designed to select accomplished individuals. She explains that hearing the bells ring before being summoned indicates that they are heroes. That's actually some pretty bad news for our boy Ken, as he was the only one that didn't hear ringing, and he wonders if he was brought there by accident. Welchi then takes him to a crystal ball that measures their magical abilities. Kazuka wonders if Ken's really okay with this, but our boy is just fine since Welchi told him that he might be able to use magic even though he isn't a hero. Kazuka thinks Ken should be more upset, but our boy isn't a whiny little dweeb like him, and he points out that they should try to be like the overly excited Suju. She is the first to be tested, and the color of the crystal indicates her affinity for thunder magic. As if that weren't amazing enough, she also has a torn of mana. Suzune couldn't be any happier, and it is now Kazuki's turn. This guy barely touches the thing, and Welchi is amazed when the crystal turns white. It's light magic, and Suzune is certain that it means he can shoot laser beams out of his eyes. Or, even better, he might be able to use swords made of light. Ken points out that Kazuki is in a weeb like her and probably has no clue what she is talking about. But she scolds him for having a sharp tongue. Suzune realizes that she likes his tongue that way, and Ken's perfect image of Suju is getting ruined every time she talks. Well, she explains that light magic is incredibly rare and that few people can use it. Light repels evil, so its power is unparalleled against demons. The bar has been set pretty high by the first two, but now it's our protagonist's turn. Ken hopes that he will at least have the tiniest bit of power, as this humble kid just hopes to help Suju and Kazuki any way he can. He is glad when his crystal actually changes color, and everyone thinks it's a soothing color. A look at Welchi paints a totally different picture, as she is shocked by this color change, and instantly drags Ken away without saying a single thing. Welchi urgently takes him to the king and explains that the other two have great abilities. However, she is there for something more important. The king has a good chuckle as he jokes about Ken having an affinity for dark magic. But this guy shuts up when Welchi reveals that the crystal ball turned green. The guards are even shocked, and while she begins to finally say what that means, King Lloyd stops her, as he doesn't even want her to utter those words, and Ken begins to wonder if his magic affinity is really that bad. Our boy just has to remain confused, as the king quickly demands that Ken be taken away from the castle as quickly as possible. They try to think of the safest place to send them, and Ken wonders if he's really that dangerous. He asks if anyone else has the same magic, and there just so happens to be another person. It's a certain girl, but the king doesn't even want her name to be spoken. Unfortunately for King Coward, this girl barges in. Everyone is terrified beyond belief as we find out that her name is Rose, and she wants to know if the heroes have been summoned. The king was really hoping that she would take the day off, but Rose would never do such a thing. She questions if Ken was a hero, but King Lloyd explains that he's just some nerd who got teleported there by accident. This guy desperately tries to hide the truth and tells her that Ken is super ordinary. Rose introduces herself to Ken as the captain of the kingdom's rescue team. But our boy feels that this angry chick is more like the type to take lives, not save them. Welchi might be a genius because she diffuses the situation and offers to take Rose to the real heroes in the crystal room. Unfortunately, Ken's an idiot who can't read the room and ask the king what his green crystal meant. Rose is still in hearing distance, so everyone is terrified by what's about to happen. Oh, but I haven't heard the magic. 
あの緑色何の属性なんですかあっ<笑>緑色と言ったかはい Ken confirms that his ball is green and Rose tells the king that she will be borrowing a boy The king decides that he must act quickly and he urgently tells Welchie to get Ken away from her Welchie uses some kind of bubble magic to quickly get him out of there but Rose instantly takes off after him Welchie sends our non-hero, Sky, high, but Rose is able to get to him almost immediately. She is crazy powerful as she destroys the bubble and rapidly captures Ken. Everyone is left with their mouths open from shock like a bunch of guppy fish, and Rose tells the king that she will turn the boy into a full-fledged healing magic user. Welchie can't handle what will happen moving forward, so she faints, and the king begs Rose to stop. He knows that she has been searching for other healing magic users, but he tries to explain that Ken was really dragged into this by accident. His useless words go completely ignored, as the two are already gone. Back in the castle, Ken's useless new friends have just been sitting on their stupid hands this entire time, but they are shocked to hear that Ken was taken away. Welchie explains that his life is not going to be ended, but it's still really bad news. He was taken to the rescue team just beyond the castle town. Healing magic users are extremely rare, and the crazy lady who took him is one of them. She intends to train Ken as her subordinate. No matter how hard Sujun uses her brain, she can't see how this is a problem. Luckily, Welchie explains it to her like she's a toddler and reveals that Rose's training methods are extremely unorthodox. At her base, Rose explains that Ken only has the potential to become a healing magic user, so that is why she brought him to the rescue team. This will be his home, and she calls on her boys. Ken was terrified by these extreme dudes, and Rose told them that they would be looking after him. She tells them to play nice, but these guys look like lunatics and introduce themselves. Ken fears the worst in every possible situation, as he wonders if he's actually making some kind of offering and if he's being sacrificed to these monsters. Rose tells them not to scare Ken, but she is the most terrifying of all. The boys try to explain that this is them being nice, but Ken doesn't think these brutes know what being nice means. Rose explains that while these meatheads are her subordinates, they are not healing magic users. There are two other healing magic users on the rescue team, but they usually work elsewhere. It's time to get to business. So Rose explains that she will beat the knowledge of how to use healing magic deep into his tiny little brain. Ken seems to be in a permanent state of disbelief, as every fiber of his being is telling him to stay away from this insane person. Ken uses his Sunday morning church voice to ask if he could learn from another teacher, but Rose ignores the nerd and tells him that training starts tomorrow. She tells the boot named Tong to let Ken stay in his room and instructs them to eat dinner before getting some rest. These guys hit Ken with a brutal reality when she leaves. As they tell him that he is screwed, Rose will be training him herself, and she's going to put him through hell. They say hell might be the least of his worries, and they may have had to have a good laugh at our non-hero's expense. That night, Ken wonders what will happen to him, but he finally shows a bit of optimism, as he is certain that things will be okay. He might be wrong, however, as we see that not even Rose knows what will happen. When Ken wakes up, he explains that he was hoping it was all a dream. Unfortunately, it's not, and he really is. In another world, Sushun and Kazuki arrive to visit him after hearing he was abducted. Ken tells them not to worry, but he has PTSD from the day before, and he gets really depressed when he remembers that he will be starting the training from hell today. <laughs> He is determined to go through with it since he wants to make himself useful. Sujun explains that they will begin their training as well, and they all decide to do their best. When they leave, Ken feels a bit bad for them being thrown into this situation, but quickly remembers that Sujun is having the time of her life. Regardless, Ken just hopes to grow strong enough to support the two heroes one day. Miss Rose startles our boy, but she points out that this isn't a prison and he can see whoever he wishes. However, that only applies when he is not training. She gives him a journal so he can record his daily training regimen and how he feels about it. They will have breakfast first, and Ken can't believe that the training from hell will really start now. After breakfast, training begins, but Ken doesn't think it's actually that bad. Rose just has him feel the mana in his body and tells him to work on drying it out. For now, he needs to perfect his senses, so she has him do some reading. Ken is shocked to see that he can read the language of this world, and it's because summoned heroes automatically have translation magic cast on them. 
Rose shows how close the demon territory is to the kingdom and explains that this is why they're always the demon's first target. This book has a bunch of information about the demons and other races in this world, so she leads him to do some studying. The first day of training seems quite easy, so he is sure that he will be able to handle it. Day two of training is much more different than he expected. It's a lot of running, and he wonders if this is really what magic training is all about. On day three, Ken is forced to run until his muscles are so sore that he can't move. He eventually collapses. But Rose wonders what he thinks he's doing. Ken explains that his legs won't move anymore, but she gives him a good smack, and he's shocked to realize that she healed his sore muscles. <laughs> Rose keeps the intensity up by calling our boy trash, and she commands him to continue running. She tells him to run like he's going to die, and she will revive him so he can keep running. Ken knows he can't tell her how crazy she sounds, so he plans to write it in his journal. On day four, Ken begins training with the other members, but he ends up falling behind by an entire lap. Everyone trash talks him for falling behind, but he can't talk back, so he decides that he will have to write it in his journal. Day five and six were more running, with Rose braiding him, Ken's anger was building inside him, and he once again planned to give Rose hell in his journal. Just then, Ken was shocked to see the light of healing magic on his hand. Training is pretty tough, but not enough to need healing, so it goes away. On day 7, Ken ran until he thought he would die again, and Rose beat him up. She seems more angry than usual, so Ken wonders if she found out that he was dissing her in his journal. He realizes that she can't read Japanese, and wonders if she can just tell by the look on his face that he talks smack in his little diary. Rose launches him into the sky so he can start running again, and Ken vows to call her a vicious gorilla in his journal. Day 8 is more of the same, but on day 9, Ken realizes the need to heal himself. He is surprised to see that he managed to heal his entire body instead of just the parts that hurt. Ken realizes that he was wrong about healing magic, and he really, really does need it. On day 10, Ken explains that he doesn't get tired anymore, no matter how much he runs, since he can now manifest healing magic on command. He eventually gets concerned, however, as all he has been doing is running. Ken wonders if he will be able to help his friends at this rate, but he knows that Rose would just punch him right in the face if he tried to voice his concerns to her. Rose is upset anyway and gives Ken another 30 laps to run. Ken decides in his mind to no longer call her Miss Rose, as she doesn't deserve any more than just being called Rose. On day 11, the training regimen gets a new addition, push-ups. Ken gets all the way up into the 800, and Rose finally reveals why. Ken was training this way so he could run from his enemies as quickly as possible in battle. This way, he can save his injured allies. She explains that the faster he runs, the faster he can save them. On day 12, he ran until noon and then did push-ups into the night. On day 13, Rose caught on to the fact that Ken was starting to feel lighter, so she added weights. On day 14, Ken's lunch goes missing, and one of the meatheads admits to eating it. Ken loses his cool and finally strikes back. He has already gotten used to the weights, and he is finally starting to get the hang of training. A week later, Ken's friends come to visit him, and they're shocked to see just how much he has changed in such a short time. This kid is doing some really intense push-ups, and Rose is telling him not to whine about doing something so easy. Ken actually doesn't whine one bit and even goes as far as to say that doing push-ups with her on his back is easy because she is so light. Rose is amused by his joke and tosses another stone on his back. Ken's extremely determined, so his body heals and he's able to complete the push-up. Rose is pleased with his progress and determines that she will be able to take him to a certain place sooner than she thought. 
Sushun is amazed by our boy's newly developed muscles, and Kazuki acknowledges just how brutal the training is. Some dude named Siglis is furious with Rose, as he thinks that she is destroying Ken. Rose tells him that she does things much differently than the knights do, and she's turning Ken into her right-hand man. She needs him to train hard, since it will be a problem if he can't even handle this. Ken is surprised to hear that she wants him as her right-hand man, and she explains that it's because she likes how he just can't stand to lose. He never gives up, and most importantly, he has been able to survive her training. Ken realizes that his wanting to teach her a lesson has backfired in the worst way, and Rose tells him to take a break. The friends are told to go with some chick named Celia to take a break, and Siglas tells Rose that he was ordered to re-enlist her. He refuses to do it now, but Rose says it doesn't matter anyway since her right eye is totally useless. At their lunch break, Ken learns that Siglas commands the kingdom's army. He is the strongest knight in the kingdom, and he's the one teaching Ken's friends how to sword fight. Ken just now realizes that Celia is the princess and apologizes for behaving so casually. They enjoy some kind of pie thing, and Kazuka wonders if Ken really does that type of training every day. Ken tells them that today was different, but that's only because today was easier. Kazuki explains that their training is going well, but it's not nearly as tough as Ken's. Sushun has apparently lost her mind as she interrupts their conversation to take a look at Ken's muscles. This dude is seriously shredded now, but Kazuka settles things down by asking if the training isn't too tough for Ken. Ken admits that it's extremely tough, and he wanted to run away at first. Rose is just as scary as ever, but he doesn't want to run anymore. The training is actually starting to get fun for him, and he has realized that life there isn't that bad. Ken's friends think he is amazing, but he just explains that what he is is stubborn. The two of them will have to fight one day, so he wants to be able to support them. They all joke around about how Sujun is a weirdo, and the big guy who ate Ken's lunch has made a meal to replace it. Ken clearly still has a grudge as he begins to talk, just like all the other meatheads, and they begin to argue. Ken is a real hothead now, as the argument quickly turns into a fight and the big guy promises to knock our boy out. Ken would like to see him try, and they both start throwing hands. Celia wonders if it's okay to just watch, and Kazuka tells her that it's fine since it seems to just be a part of Ken's daily life. Now, Ken has clearly acclimated very quickly, so Kazuka decides that he needs to go back to training so he doesn't get left behind. Sujun prepares to go as well, but realizes now that all three of them must have been brought to this world for a reason. That night, Ken enjoys a bath and thinks about how he needs to control his riz better so Sujun doesn't lose her composure again. Ken realizes that she is right. His body has changed dramatically. He has been healing his muscles over and over again after damaging them from this strenuous exercise. The result is that he has gotten shredded. However, his job will be to rescue people on the battlefield and he questions if he has the mental fortitude to match the body he has built. The next morning, Rose informs Ken that they will be going out, and the other guy seems worried that this day has come. A guard at the gate nearly wets himself as Rose informs him that she wants to show her subordinate the outside world. He runs off to open the gate for her, and Ken thinks about how all she has to do is stand there to scare someone. Outside the gate, Ken wants to know where they're going, but Rose tells him to keep his mouth shut and follow her. They eventually arrive at the forest known as the Darkness of Linga. It's infamous for being filled with monsters, and she shockingly tells Ken not to come back until he has haunted down a Grand Grizzly. Ken thinks there has been a misunderstanding, as he reminds her that Blue Grizzlies only turned into Grand Grizzlies after living for a hundred years. The book he read even said that just the Blue Grizzlies are extremely dangerous. Rose explains that he should be able to take one down easily, but Ken points out that he has only been running this entire time and has no idea how to fight. Rose doesn't give a single word of explanation and just launches in towards the forest. Ken begins to fall from the sky and he panics as he will surely not survive. However, just then, his body begins to glow with his healing magic. Ken finds the determination inside himself to survive no matter what, so he uses his healing magic to brace himself for the impact. <laughs> Ken can't believe it he survived, and he heals himself so he can do what Rose told him. He won't be able to go back until he does, so he tries to have a good attitude about it. He convinces himself that it shouldn't be too hard since it's only a 2 meter tall bear. 
but he is stunned when it appears behind him. This thing is way bigger than he thought, and even its claws are huge. Ken gets a bit confident that the bear won't be able to keep up with this speed, but he quickly finds out that it can. Ken reminds himself that he managed to survive the training from hell, and this little teddy bear is nothing compared to Rose. Ken surprisingly turns to face the bear, but Winnie the Pooh with rabies has back up. Ken runs for his life again because the bear's cowards are ganging up on him and Ken hears a waterfall nearby and leaps into it to escape. The bears have no choice but to leave their prey, and Ken uses the time to regather himself. All he has are some rations, a canteen, and a knife, so he wishes Rose would have given him something he could at least start a fire with. Taking down a grand grizzly is starting to seem impossible at this point, but he will leave that depressing task for tomorrow. Ken is just glad to have survived the first day and sleeps in a pile of leaves. The next day, Ken begins to hunt and decides that he needs to learn more about his enemy. First, he needs to learn where it lives, and he finds some scratch marks on a tree. Just then, Ken prepares for the fight of his life as he hears wrestling in some bushes, but it turns out to just be an innocent little bunny. It's actually a monster that looks like a rabbit, and it seems to be injured. Ken heals the thing up and acts like a bunny whisperer as he tells it to be more careful. Ken continues to hunt, but the bunny follows him. He tries to explain that he's searching for a dangerous monster, so it should leave, but the dumb little bunny doesn't listen. This thing just won't leave him alone, so he begins to wonder if the rabbit's trying to show him where the grand grizzly is. Ken follows the little guy, and it leads him right next to the bears. Ken plans to monitor them without being discovered and notices that they seem to be a family. Ken takes a break to get some unclean water that he's a bit skeptical of, and he's shocked to see that the bunny still hasn't left yet. He goes back to continue monitoring, and he's begun to think that the blue grizzlies are kind of cute. His bunny friend is pretty adorable too, so he begins to think that life in the forest is pretty good. That feeling wouldn't last long, however, as the water he drank had a severe effect on his stomach. His healing magic is taking forever to make him feel better, so he determines that he was basically poisoned by the water. A day later, Ken's trusty bunny friend shows him where some clean water is, and it's delicious. There's something wrong with Bugs Bunny, and it seems to be because a monster is approaching. Little Bunny wasn't even scared of the Grand Grizzly, so whatever is approaching must be really dangerous. A noise can be heard in the darkness, and Ken is shocked when a giant snake appears. He is terrified by this unbelievable monster and points out that there was nothing like it in the book he read. Even without knowing anything about it, Ken can tell that it's dangerous, and there's bloodlust oozing from every inch of it. When it leaves, Ken can finally breathe again, and he decides to make it a priority to avoid that thing. Four more days pass, but Ken can't shake the uneasy feeling he has. He has been observing the bears, but nothing has changed with them, and he can't go home without defeating the Grand Grizzly. Ken has to do it eventually, so he tells himself that he will do it tomorrow. The next day comes, but Little Rabbit doesn't want him to go. Ken gives in and decides to stay, but only until the rain stops. When it ends, Ken begins his mission and refuses to be stopped by Bunny. Ken readies himself for battle, but he is absolutely stunned when he finds that the lives of the bears have already been taken. The bite marks on the bears make it clear that the snake did it, but it didn't do it to eat. It took their lives for fun. The poor cub emerges from some rubble and tries to wake his mom up. Ken thinks about how much he hates losing, especially to Rose. On top of that, he hates the fact that his prey was stolen, as a little bear cries in agony. Ken states that what he hates worst of all is what he's looking at right now. He tells the cub to just wait right there, and he vows to get revenge for it. Ken's friends go to visit him, but they are shocked to hear he has been training in the forest for 10 straight days. They think that seems a bit too long to be training out there. But the guys explain that Rose makes all the decisions. Rose isn't there, so these useless guys have no clue what's going on. Kazuki is really worried about Ken, but Sujun thinks he should be fine since Rose wouldn't have sent him unless he was ready. 
On top of that, Su Jun believes in Ken, and she is sure he will be back soon. Back in the forest, our boy fuels his body with some snacks and makes a spear. He asks his little bunny to take him to the snake, but make sure to instruct it to run away right after. The bunny takes him on a long journey through the forest, and the two finally find the snake. Unfortunately, it is attacking the little cub, and Ken is upset since he told it to stay home. This snake is absolutely terrifying to look at, but Ken insists that there's nothing scarier than Rose. Ken thinks the snake looks confused when he begins his attack, but it's not, and it almost eats him. <laughs> Ken counters with a stab to the eye, but he gets knocked back and must heal himself. Ken managed to blind it on one side, so he determines that it's a side he will have to attack from. This snake is insanely dangerous, and it quickly manages to bite down on our boy's arm. Ken's in immense pain, and he is shocked to realize that the snake baited him into attacking its blind spot. Ken is furious to have been tricked, but he reveals that the arm was holding his knife. Ken manages to heal his arm enough so that it can move, and he stabs the snake from inside its mouth. <laughs> Ken is somehow managing to hold his own, but things take a real bad turn as he realizes that he has been poisoned. This is a seriously unfair fight, as the snake is both huge and poisonous but Ken has the advantage of being able to heal himself. Getting poisoned by the water forced him to learn how to heal himself from the inside out. Ken does just that and prepares to attack again. This snake is about to end his life with one tail swing, but the little cub steps in to help. These two have great teamwork right off the bat, as the bear lets Ken jump off its back so he can get on top of the snake. Ken uses some foul language to call the snake stupid, and he somehow manages to land an insanely powerful punch. Ken's determined to end the battle right now, so he jams the spear further into the snake's head. He yells out as he gives it everything he has, and the little bear helps out by pinning the snake down. The snake is eventually defeated. and Ken can't believe that they actually did it. The bear seems to have taken a liking to Ken, and he points out how they got revenge. He would like to heal the little cub, but he is using up all his mana to neutralize the venom in his body, and he can't even move. That's really bad news, as he is shocked when the snake gets back up. Ken can't even move an inch, so the little cub tries to help him, but Ken just tells it to run away. The snake moves in to end his life, and Ken thinks about all the people in his life, he determines that this entire situation is all Rose's fault, and he yells out that she is a violent ogre. Just then, this violent ogre descends from the sky and shockingly stomps right on the snake. Her angry attitude causes her to call the snake an idiot. When Ken wonders how she knew to come help him, Rose reveals that the bunny named Kokoro told her Kokoro was her pet and she told him to watch over Ken. Ken explains that the rabbit showed up injured and looking for help, but Rose just points out that he is a sucker. Kokoro put on an act to gain his trust, and he fell for it. Rose was always nearby in case she needed to step in, but she planned to intervene as little as possible. However, she never thought that the giant snake would appear. This snake was created by the Demon Lord's army, and Siglas failed to finish it off during the last invasion. She never thought it would be able to defeat a Grand Grizzly, since they are strong enough to defeat a full unit of elite troops. Ken can't believe she wanted a rookie like him to take one out, and he thinks about how much of a monster she is. Rose explains that she actually never expected Ken to win, and the goal was for him to gain experience fighting something much stronger than him. Things started to get interesting with Ken, so she decided to let him keep going to see what would happen. Ken is quick to point out that he almost lost his life, and his little cub backs him up. It has clearly taken a liking to him, 
and Ken remembers that its parents aren't alive anymore, so it's all alone. Ken gets his new buddy to calm down, and Rose realizes that she was right. Ken's a lot like her. She angrily informs the bear that he will be coming with them, and he will carry the loser, who couldn't even lose his life properly. Ken wonders if the cub is really okay with everything, but this is one mature bear that's ready to go. They prepare to head back, but Ken can't help but think how terrifying Rose is as she carries him and the bear over her shoulder. Rose reveals that she heard what he said about her being an ogre. She then terrifies her boy as she explains that he won't be getting any sleep tonight. They head home, and Rose reveals that Ken actually passed the test with flying colors. Ken is surprised to hear that he is qualified for something, and Rose explains that he's now qualified to stand beside her on the battlefield. He still hasn't mastered the basics, but Ken definitely has what it takes. He has the ability to withstand pain, physical aptitude, and a strong mental state. The other two healers never earn that distinction, so she tells Ken that he should be proud. Ken wonders what she means when she says that they might be able to make it, and he is shocked when Rose reveals that the demon army will be attacking soon. Elsewhere, the demon lord wonders how preparations are going for the invasion of the lingering kingdom. Camilla, the commander of the third army, reports that their units have finished preparing for battle and will soon advance. Rose reveals that Ken will be on the front lines with her healing the wounded, and he will be part of the vanguard. There are two other healers, but they play a different role. Ken is certain that he can't use healing magic the way she can, but Rose points out that they still have a little more time. She wants him to improve before then, and Ken wonders if he can really do it. Back with the Demon Lord, he explains that he will have Amila lead the army. Despite their previous success, the Linga Kingdom has managed to escape their grasp before. Amila vows to do her best to win the battle, and she's dismissed. Just then, the Demon Doctor mocks Amila for being nervous in front of the Demon Lord. Amila hates this nerd and tells him to focus on his work. His name is Hyrulak, and he reveals that he just completed the newest demon-made monster prototype. It's highly venomous and has a large body with sharp fangs. He calls it the demon-made monster prototype, 72 Baljanak. Hyrulak's last prototype went missing the last time they attacked the Linga Kingdom. It ran away after being wounded by the enemy known as Siglis. Hyrulak promises that this prototype is way stronger, and Amila hopes so, since there are people far more troublesome than Siglis in the Linga Kingdom. They refer to these people as kidnappers, those who stand on the battlefield but don't fight. They carry their injured away without the enemy even realizing it, and they minimize their own casualties by doing so. Their boss is a healer who runs around all over the front lines, healing people on the spot. We see that this is Rose, and Amila is infuriated by her. This is because Rose is a top-notch fighter, and she holds a deep grudge against the Demon Lord. Amila vows to eliminate her, but Hyrulup points out that she can't go into battle herself this time since she is now the commander. She is well aware, so that is why she plans to send a certain demon, the immortal Mage of Darkness, the Black Knight, back home. We see that Ken finally gets to enjoy the comforts of a bed again. He goes to feed his little bear buddy some fruit and snacks on some himself. The little cub is kind of a jerk as he takes Ken's apple, and Ken finds that the traitor is there as well. This rabbit toyed with his pure and innocent heart, so he stopped himself from thinking about how cute it was. He eventually gives in to its adorableness and feeds it some fruit. Rose arrives and is amused to hear that Ken named the bear Blurin, blue for its color, ripped from the word grizzly. This kid is a total mess, as he thinks the name is a good one, and Blurin accidentally chomps on his hand. Rose informed the kingdom about the bear, so they had been allowed to keep it. Rose will allow it to stay there, but she informed Blurin that he will have to earn his keep. Blurin is terrified of her, just like everyone else, and Ken wonders what she will have him do. Moments later, we see what she had planned, as Ken was carrying Blurin. This will be his simulation training, and Ken needs to think of the bear as someone who needs to be rescued. Rose has them start running, but it's a breeze for our boy. It's basically just running with a bit more weight, so as long as he manages his mana, he will be fine. Rose demands that he run faster since the wounded won't last. If he takes too long, just then Tong appears out of nowhere, and so does another one of the meatheads. They chase after him and reveal that Rose told them to simulate the battlefield. The others are waiting to ambush him as well, so they tell Ken to stay focused. One hour later, 
Ken dodging one of the meathead's special stink water and avoiding the attacks of some other guy. Three hours later, he is hopping over logs, and four hours later, he is avoiding stomping all over the trader. Eventually, Ken starts feeling strange and begins to wonder what is happening to him. He collapses, and Rose explains that he is at his limit of endurance. On the battlefield, humans feel exhaustion from nervousness, fear, and impatience. That's why he ran out of strength faster than normal. To get better, all he can do is get used to it and acquire the mental fortitude and decisiveness that never falter in the face of fear. Rose heals him, but tells him to spend the rest of the afternoon running around the castle town. Ken was shocked to have to do more, and Rose reminded him to carry Blurin. As he runs, everyone is shocked to see a blue bear. Ken expected this, since even though Blurin is friendly, he is still a monster. The people seem to realize something and become eerily calm. Blurin leads Ken to some fresh fruit, but our boy doesn't have money. Ken learns that this green fruit is called a peffel and asks the merchant why everyone is so calm when he is carrying a monster on his back. She reveals that it's because they know that Ken is on the rescue team because of his clothes. They see scary looking men from the rescue team all the time, so they have gotten used to it. This makes a lot of sense now since if those goons faces don't scare them, then nothing will. The nice lady lets them have a peppo for free, so Blurin shoves Ken's hand in his mouth. When they leave, some girl named Amarco shows interest in the boy from the rescue team. Ken decides to go visit his friends and doesn't notice when some guy tries to get his attention. Ken eventually figures it out and has to heal the guy. This guy's name is Orga, and he reveals that he is one of the rescue team's healers. Orga is surprised to learn that Ken was summoned with the heroes, and Ken explains that he's been so busy training that he almost forgot himself. Orga is impressed that Ken is able to keep up with Rosa's training, since it was impossible for him and his sister. His sister is the other healer, and she is five years younger than him. They run a clinic in the city and use healing magic to heal the citizens. Orga collapsed earlier because he is terrible at healing himself and much better at healing others. They're still part of the rescue team, so they work under Captain Rose in times of need. Ken wonders what war will be like for them, so Orga explains that Tong and the others bring the injured soldiers to the rear. That is where he and his sister heal them. This guy is shocked when Ken tells them that Rose wants him on the vanguard, and Ken wonders if he can really handle that. Augur explains that the knights and heroes who fight on the front lines are in the greatest danger. Ken immediately thinks of his friends when they fall injured and get left behind. Normally, all they can do is wait for death. However, having a rescue team allows them to be saved. The job is a dangerous and exhausting one, but Rose wouldn't choose someone she didn't completely trust. Before Olga leaves, he asks Ken not to hate Rose too much. He knows she isn't the nicest person, but he explains that it's more like she is just clumsy with people. Ken surprises him when he reveals that he has never hated Rose, even if he does have unresolved issues with her. When Ken leaves, Olga expresses relief that Rose has finally found someone. Olga's sister Yururu arrives, and he tells her that he just met someone interesting. They will meet each other soon enough, and he is sure that Yururu will like him. At the castle, Ken is allowed to enter with Blurin because Rose vouches for him. Ken thanks the guard, and he thinks about how a lot of people seem to trust Rose. Ken runs past a bunch of people training and finds Sujun. She's glad to see him, but wonders what the blue thing is on his back. Ken tells her about his forest adventure, but she just wants to know if she can touch the bear. Ken lets her in and promises to heal her if she gets bitten. Sujun considers herself the heroine of their little story, so she is certain the animals are supposed to love her. She is very wrong, however, as Blurin hilariously slaps her hand away. Ken tries to make her feel better by saying that Blurin is just shy and having her try calling his name. Sujun politely asks Blurin to be friends, but he just eats her hand instead. Ken doesn't make her feel any better at all this time and suggests that she might have a tainted soul. Ken has Blurin release her, but Blurin just starts eating his hand now and Sujun wonders if Ken has a tainted soul as well. After their little comedy routine, Ken notices that Sujun's hands are all roughed up, and she explains that it's from going hard. During training, Ken reminds her that she needs to treat wounds properly, so he heals her. Sujun is amazed, and she wonders if Ken really came just to see her. 
Ken points out that he came to see his friends, but that's obviously not what she wanted to hear. Sushun reveals that Kazuka went outside the kingdom to gain experience fighting monsters with Siglis and the others. Siglis informs Kazuka that the Demon Lord will attack soon, and it will surely bring more powerful forces this time. Siglis points out, however, that they have him and Suju now, so the troops' morale is soaring. Because they are heroes, Siglis is certain that they will be victorious, but Kazuka seems to have doubts. He gathers himself and promises to do his best. Just then, they encounter some monsters and prepare for battle. When Kazuka returns, it will be Suzune's turn to gain experience. Ken can tell already that she will have the time of her life, but she wishes he would worry about her. Ken says he does, but Suzune points out that he didn't really seem to mean it, and they have a good laugh. Ken leaves, and Suzune wonders if Ken even realized how comfortable he has gotten with her. As Ken runs, he thinks about how everyone is preparing for the war, so he wants to be able to help them. In his old world, all he could do was admire people who could do things he couldn't. However, he is not that weak person anymore. That night, Rose is glad to hear that Ken's training is going well, but he explains that he still needs to run more to get used to it. Ken stopped her from leaving, as he wants to talk about what she said earlier. He points out that he barely survived against the snake monster, so he was terrified when she mentioned the Demon Lord's army. He didn't want to set foot on the battlefield, but today he found a feeling even stronger than fear. He realizes now that he can fight, but he refuses to take any lives. He vows to save anyone he can, and he declares that it's because he is part of the rescue team. That's exactly what Rose wanted to hear. Since they are going out there to save people, his job is to snatch up the wounded that the enemy is about to finish off. It's also to keep those at that store alive, even if it means risking his life. Rose wants him to keep spitting up those ideals, since that's how the rescue team must be. This was the first moment when Ken actually felt like he was part of the rescue team. The next morning, Rose reveals that the king had sent a message. He wants Ken to head out so he can join Sujun training outside the castle. Ken is surprised, but we see that Sujun couldn't be more ready. Ken wonders why he has to join Sujun and points out that Kazuka had Siglis with him. Rose explains that Ken was supposed to join Kazuki as well, but he just got back from the forest. She assures Ken that he will only be there in case they need a healer, and he should be back home in three days. Sujun is glad to see Ken, but even more excited to have Blurin join them. She assumes that he brought the bears so they could learn to bond, but that is not the case. Ken only brought him because Blurin doesn't like anyone else. Sujun then introduces him to Aruku, the knight, and Corin, the mage. Ken recognizes this guy, and it turns out that he used to just be a measly side character that stood watch at the castle gate. Rose explains to Sujun that Ken's healing magic is an omnipotent. It can heal wounds and cure poison, but it cannot bring people back from the dead. She tells them not to take it for granted, and Sujun completely understands. Rose is certain that they will be fine. Since Sujun was trained by Siglis, and Rose has nothing to say to Ken, Ken knew she wouldn't have anything nice to say anyway, so Rose leaves them be. Sujun can tell that Rose is really strong, but Ken doesn't know what she means. Sujun just lets it go, and they set out to begin training. Back at the castle, Celia is worried when she sees Kazuka practicing his sword strikes. She points out that he just got back from training, but he assures her that he got a lot of rest. The shy, Celia is glad, but asks him to take care of himself, and she leaves. Sujun tells Ken about how exhausted Kazuka was after training, but Kazuka says that the experience was definitely worth it. He battled a ton of monsters in it, clearing the darkness of Linga, and that's exactly what they will be doing as well. Ken just got back from there, and he wonders if Blurin misses home. Sujun wants to take advantage of the fact that Blurin is asleep by petting him, but Ken watches out for his boy. Sujun doesn't like how he is talking down to her and pushing her back, so she wonders if he has become some kind of misogynist. Blurin finally wakes up, but he's clearly still pretty drowsy as he tries to walk. The genius Sujun takes any chance she can get to get close to Blurin, so she offers to carry him on her back. Ken thinks that's a terrible idea, but Sujun loves how fluffy Blurin is. Her joy is short-lived, however, as her body collapses under the weight of the big cub. After Ken heals her, Corin detects multiple entities ahead of them. Iruku tells the others to get back, and some bandits appear disappointed to have been found. They were planning an ambush, so they decided to try and rob our group. 
Uruku refuses to give up any goods, but the bandits point out that they are way outnumbered. Ken takes one look at the sorry bunch and thinks about how they aren't intimidating at all. Ken assures Sujun that they aren't a threat, but she's just amazing to see bandits for the first time. The guys are terrified to see a blue bear, but they realize that it's just a cub. These horrible guys decide to catch it and skin it alive, but Sujun instantly comes to his defense. Ken is impressed that Sujun used such a powerful attack while managing not to end the guy's life, and he encourages her to go all out. The bandits decide to avoid the magic attacks by getting in close range. Ken treats Sujun like a Pokemon and instructs her to use Thunderbolt. Sujun easily wrecks the bandits, but she does not like being treated like Pikachu. Iruku joins the fight, but they're interrupted by a horde of balls. This is shocking since they live much deeper in the forest, and Blurin must step in to push some of them back. Ken takes a hit while protecting Sujun and uses his healing magic to brace their fall. They end up falling through some trees and into a river, but Sujun is in bad shape. Ken realizes that this is the same river he jumped into before and remembers that there is a waterfall ahead. He tells Sujun to take a deep breath and blacks out. When out of the river, Sujun sees that Ken isn't waking up, so she vows to get him to safety. She plans to repay her debt for him saving her, but Ken reveals that he just woke up and is fine. He is only a little embarrassed now, but so is she. Ken explains that he was just taking a break after pulling her out of the water, but everything is fine now. Ken heals her up while she apologizes, but he explains that he wouldn't want to be stranded with anyone else other than her. Ken then explains that Rose left them in this forest before, and it's filled with monsters that make those boards they just saw look like pets. A check of their inventory reveals that they don't even have enough food to last one night. Sujun thinks they should prioritize escaping the forest if it's really as dangerous as he says, but Ken points out that it's going to get dark soon. It might also rain, so they need to find a spot to camp for the night. Ken says they can sleep on a tree branch like he did before, but Sujun reveals that she has never climbed a tree before. She always wanted to, but she was never allowed to. Ken wonders if she was raised by strict parents and decides that they can just take shelter from the rain in a little cave. Ken recommends that she get out of her wet clothes, but she makes some promise not to peek first. Afterwards, Sujun uses her lightning ability to catch some fish. She then uses it to start a fire, and Ken couldn't be happier to have her around. Sujun awkwardly sits away from Ken and notices that he is even more ripped than before. Just then, some venom monkeys appear. Ken has only read about them, and this is his first time seeing them in person. Sujun thinks one of the babies is cute, and Ken explains that they aren't aggressive. He warns her not to touch them, as they are venomous, but Sujun is already petting away. She has accepted that this is the price to pay for enjoying its cuteness, but the little monkey bites her. Sujun confidently points out that she was right since there is nothing to fear, but she collapses. At the castle, Corin's familiar has informed the king that Sujun and Ken have gone missing. The king wasn't going to tell Kazaki, but Celia made him. The king explains that the search team will be ready tomorrow, but Kazuki isn't satisfied with that. Kazuka heads off to search himself, but Rose stops him. She explains that Sujun and Ken are likely to be together. This means there is nothing to worry about, as Ken is her subordinate and he won't die so easily. Back in the forest, Ken is having a way better time with Sujun around, as surviving this time is a breeze. Sujun doesn't like being talked about like she is camping equipment, but Ken actually really appreciates her being there. Ken decides that they should take turns sleeping, so he lets her go first. She refuses and tells Ken to go to sleep since he must be tired from all the healing he has been doing. As it begins to rain, Sujun checks to see if Ken is sleeping yet, but he is still awake. Sujun wonders if he ever wants to go home, which he does, but he explains that he also has a reason to stay. Sujun doesn't hesitate to say that she doesn't want to go back, and it's surprising that Ken doesn't ask why she wants him to ask, but Ken thinks he already knows. He correctly assumes that it's because she likes this world better. Sujun explains that she feels like there is nothing left for her in their old world, her family, her friends, and even her old self. She would throw it all away to stay in this new world. She has waited her entire life for a chance to be free, and in this world, there's nothing tying her down. Sujun would trade anything for this freedom, and she is surprised when Ken understands. She thought he would be disappointed by who she really is, but Ken explains that he was tired of his old self as well, tired of his ordinary life and passive self. When they first arrived, 
Ken just didn't want to hold his two friends back. However, now he's determined to protect her, Kazuki, and the people of the kingdom. As a member of the rescue squad, Sujun understands and proclaims that she wants to protect the people. As a hero, they make a pact to forget their old world and protect the here and now. Sujun is amazed by how much her boy has grown, and Ken points out how she is much more relatable now. Ken used to think that she was just a perfect girl, but Sujun is surprised since he has been treating her pretty casually. She doesn't mind, since you'd rather be close to him than admired from afar. Things get a bit awkward, so Ken goes to sleep. But Sujun teases him about being flustered. Sujun is glad that they had their little chat and wishes him a good night. The next morning, our pair looked for a way out of the forest, but there was consensus that a beast was approaching. This beast turned out to just be Blurin, who ends up smothering Ken. Uruku is with him but also exhausted. When he recovers, Iruku explains that they were searching the perimeter of the forest when Blurin rushed off on his own. They chased after him, and they realize now that Blurin must have picked up on Ken's scent. Just then, Blurin picks up on another scent, and Ken explains that this was Blurin's home. He tells the tragic story of what happened to Blurin's parents, and everyone feels bad for the little cub. Blurin is clearly ready to leave, and Sujun points out that he seems to have made a decision. Blurin must know that his place now is by Ken's side. It's time to go home. Ken and Sujun return to the castle, where the king's glad to see that they're back from the forest. Sujun apologizes for making them worry, but the king explains that he should be the one apologizing. He does apologize for getting Ken mixed up in all of this, but our boy has gotten used to being in situations like those. Ken quickly realizes that being used to extreme situations might look bad for Rose, so he lies and says that he was talking about his old world. The king is eager to hear about how Ken's rescue squad training is going. Our boy lies again and says that it's been nothing but smooth sailing. Ken was shocked by Rose's face, since it looks like he said exactly what she wanted him to, and he wonders if he has been conditioned by her on a psychological level. The two of them are dismissed, but Rose and Siglis are told to stay behind. This guy's face was pretty grave, so Ken wonders what they are talking about. Kazuki arrives, but he thinks that Ken's behaving way too casually. He was very worried about them, and Celia explains that Kazuki was ready to dash out of the castle for them. Sujun calls him reckless, but Ken reminds her that she was the one who got bitten by a poison monkey. Ken tries to share the little story, but Sujun is way too embarrassed to let him. Kazuka tells them how Rose assured him that they would be fine in the forest, but Ken thinks about what she probably really meant, that the woods are easy mode compared to her training. Kazuka was in awe of the confidence she had in Ken, but Ken thinks that he's just a pure innocent boy for taking Rose's words at face value. Ken asks that he never change and declares that only he and Rose need to be tainted. The group separates, and Celia points out how close they are. Kazuki assumes that she means Sujun and Ken, but she explains that she was talking about all of them. Kazaka looked like he was having a lot of fun with them there, and he points out that it's because they were already friends before coming to this world. Celia would like to be one of their friends, so she asks Kazaka to not adjust her formally anymore. She apologizes for being so forceful, but her message is received and Kazaki agrees to just call her Celia from now on. In the castle, the king explains that they have interrogated the bandits who attacked Ken's group. Minister Sergio reveals that these bandits notice far fewer monsters than normal in that area. Soon after, they were attacked by a herd of four boars in the forest. This surprising information means that the monsters must be fleeing the plains for the forest. They are fleeing from something horrible, and Siglis predicts that it's a demon lord's army. Unlike their previous battle, the Demon Lord won't underestimate them again, so they will likely attack with everything at their disposal. The King has the man inform the others in charge of war to be ready, and he has a request for Rose as well. This isn't something he would normally ask of the rescue squad leader, but Rose says that she is prepared. She has already determined that the King wants her to find out how far the Demon Lord's army has come, and he apologizes for asking for something so dangerous. Rose already knows that she is the fastest person in the entire kingdom, so she agrees to go. The king has another request and asks her to return to her post as the battalion commander. Rose refuses and explains that she bears more guilt than he seems to realize. The king reminds her that she was the first healer ever to be appointed battalion commander, and he wonders why she's so hard on herself. He then realizes that she hasn't forgiven herself. 
She explains that she has accepted the deaths of all her subordinates and the fact that no amount of healing will bring them back. The scar that has been carved into her right eye will never let her forget them. The king tries to explain that it's not her burden to bear, but she points out that they died because she was too full of herself. This scar is her punishment, and it will never let her forget her sins. That is why she created the rescue squad, not to fight, but to focus on saving lives. The king points out that the rescue squad saved many lives in the war two years ago, but that isn't enough for Rose. The rescue squad has another purpose as well, and that is to help her find a subordinate who will not die. The king points out how that's not humanly possible, but Rose explains that that's what all the training is for. Healing magic, the determination to push one's body beyond its limits, and an iron wall that will never bend in the face of an opponent. She has been searching for someone who has all three of these traits, and that person is Ken. He has survival instincts, adaptability, and the will to live. On top of all that, he keeps standing up to her, and he will never give up. He is a cheeky brat and reminds her of the guys who are no longer with them. That is why she is determined to make him the ideal healer. Rose apologizes for getting carried away with her little speech and heads for the border. That night, Ken finds out that Rose left a letter for him. It reveals that there won't be training tomorrow, and she instead wants him to deliver another letter. Rose told the guys that she wouldn't be there for dinner, so Ken wonders where she is. Elsewhere, the demons are building a bridge, and Amila demands that her subordinates give their all for the demon lord. The Black Knight watches this and declares that she's being way too enthusiastic. It annoys him, but Amila reminds him that she is his commanding officer. He points out that they were at the same level in the second army. But things are different now, and Amila demands that he obey her. The Black Knight begrudgingly agrees, and Amila tells Hyrulov that the bridge will be complete in a few hours. Once it's finished, their invasion of the Linga Kingdom can finally begin. Just then, the demons find that a Linga scout has appeared, but Amila doesn't care. By the time the scout spreads the word, it will already be too late. This lady clearly has no clue who this scout really is, as Rose launches an entire tree trunk to destroy their bridge. The tree trunk was thrown from really far away, and Amila is furious when she realizes that it was Rose. This is only supposed to be a reconnaissance mission for Rose, but she's glad to have bought them some time. The next day, Ken goes to deliver the letter, but he can't understand why people are staring at him even when he doesn't have Blurin. The old merchant offers to let him have some fruit, but he doesn't have time. He decides to come back later, and the creepy girl from earlier stares at him. Ken arrives to deliver the letter, and Yururu tries to remember his name since her brother Olga told her about him. She eventually remembers and introduces herself. Ken is standing in the flat clinic, which is run by Olga and Yururu. Olga is examining a patient, and Ken feels a bit weird when Yururu lets him take a peek. They must be quiet, as Olga is concentrating and Ken's amazed. See how intense the color of Olga's healing magic is. Its flow is also very smooth, which Ken notices is nothing like his own. Olga fixes the kid right up, but the kid wonders who the weirdos watching them are. Afterwards, Yururu wonders how everyone in the rescue squad is doing, and Ken explains that they're all still walking around with ugly bad guy faces. Ken remembers hearing that she was part of the rescue squad, but she explains that unlike Ken, she wasn't able to keep up with the training. Reading the letter clearly bothers Olga, but he keeps it a secret. Yururu then explains that Rose put everything into training her and her brother. When they first joined the squad, they were really excited about it, but it didn't work out. Not only did Yururu struggle to keep up, but she also became really afraid of Rose. Rose seemed desperate back then, but Yururu points out that she seems much happier now. Ken has a pretty jaded view of Rose and thinks that she is just happy because she has a new punching bag. Just then, Augus informed me that someone fell off a roof while trying to fix it. Two others were injured as well, so Olga asks Ken to come with them. When they arrive, Ken wants to hear Olga's plan, but the doctor is exhausted. They eventually start healing, but Ken thinks about how, besides himself, he has only ever healed Olga and Suju. Their injuries weren't even that bad, but he realizes that if war really breaks out, then he will most likely have to treat injuries even more severe than what he faces now. Even worse, he will have to do it mid-battle. Olga reminds Ken to remain calm and explains that who Ken treats or where he treats them doesn't matter. Ken has the power to heal them, so Olga tells them that he just needs to believe that he can do it. 
These words remind Ken that even Rose believes in him, so he starts believing in himself as well. This calms him down a great deal, and he's able to heal the idiot that fell off the roof. Afterwards, the siblings compliment our boy for a job well done, and Olga even asks him to stop by some time to lend a hand. Ken agrees and heads home. Yururu thinks Olga looks pretty cool when giving Ken advice, but Olga gets really serious. The letter revealed that the Demon Lord's army is close, and they have been summoned to war. Ken doesn't have any war experience, so he must rely on absolute confidence in his own abilities. Olga is confident that Rose knows what she is doing, but he declares that he will do everything he can too. War is starting, but Odd assures his sister that everything will be okay Ken goes to collect his fruit, but wonders if a girl is lost when she stops him. This strange girl says that Ken is the only one who can see it, and that is why this is a future he can change. Ken has no clue what this little chick is talking about, but his confusion turns to shock when her eye begins to glow. Ken then sees shocking images of war, and what's even more horrifying is that he sees the Dark Knight kill his friends. Ken heart beats rapidly and he is so horrified that he can barely move. The girl explains that she has just done him a great favor, and he now has a duty to repay her. Ken still can't believe what he just saw. Ken chases after the little girl as he is determined to question her about why he saw the deaths of his friends. The girl watches him nearby and thinks about how Ken's the only one who can change the future. Ken asks a guard if he has seen the little fox girl, but he hasn't. Rose arrives to scare the guy away, so Ken pities him for being terrified by Rose. Ken can understand him as Rose manhandles him. She wants to hear more about how scary she is, but Ken manages to change the conversation and where she has been. Rose reveals that she destroyed a bridge that the demon army was trying to make while she was scouting. Ken has a serious smart mouth as he points out that she did a lot more than just some scouting, but this just gets him manhandled again. Rose explains that she has seen the fox girl before, and she appeared there two years ago. The fox girl is only 12 years old, but she somehow managed to evade bandits and kidnappers to arrive at the capital. Demi-humans like her are extremely valuable to bandits since they are prized for their physical appearance. More importantly, some even have an aptitude for rare magic. Ken wonders if this rare magic is able to show people visions of the future that they hope will never happen. Rose reveals that there are rumors of beastmen who can use magic called precondition. They are extremely rare, and even if they existed, they would be well guarded. Back in the beast lands, Rose probes further about why he wants to know, but Ken pretends that he was just wondering about the beast people since he read about them in a book that night. The king thanks Rose for buying them some time, but she points out that the demon army will likely be building another bridge soon. It will only take a couple of days to finish. So the king decides to inform the soldiers and citizens about the invasion. He will do it tomorrow, but he wants to speak with Sujun and Kazuk it before the night is over. On their way to see the king, Ken's friends run into Sinya. Kazuka has a pretty awkward interaction with her, and after exchanging pleasantries, they part ways. Sujun wonders what happened between them, but Kazuka says it was nothing. Elsewhere, Ken finds that he can't fall asleep. He can't stop thinking about the vision and how, if it is the future, there's nothing he can do about it. However, he remembers that the fox girl told him that he's actually the only one who can change this future. Just then, Ken spots something outside, and it turns out to be Kazuki. The two talk about how much they have been training, and Kazuki reveals that they just spoke with the king. They were told that the battle with the Demon Lord's army would soon begin, but they both already knew that. However, when Kazuka pictured himself fighting, he couldn't fall asleep. He admits that he ran away from the castle to come here, and reveals that he is scared to fight. It's not just now. He was even scared when he fought monsters for the first time. His legs froze up, and he only managed to fight at the last second. It was only when the fight ended that he realized just how lightly he had been taking everything. He can see things more clearly now and realizes that the Demon Lord's army will do everything they can to kill him. He is terrified of this, but he is under extreme pressure because everyone is counting on him. Ken breaks the tension by telling Kazaka how cool he is. Ken always thought that he never got scared, but he realizes now that that is not the case. The expectations of those around Kazaka have been an immense burden. Ken points out that Kazaka doesn't actually have to live up to those expectations, and sometimes he can put himself first. As for Ken, he confidently explains that he will be going to battle. 
He wants to save those who will fight the Demon Lord's army. Ken is, of course, scared as well, but he has already made his decision. Kazuki reminds Ken that he was just dragged into this by accident, and now he can even die. Ken admits that he was brought there by accident, but a lot has happened since then. There have been tough times, but he has also met a lot of people who have shown him the way he wants to help them, and that includes Kazuki. Ken points out that even if Kazuki doesn't fight, they will be friends. Either way, these words turn out to be just what Kazuki needed to hear. Kazuka snaps himself out of depression and declares that he will fight to protect Ken and Zuzu. He isn't sure if he can fight as a hero, but he definitely knows that he wants to help his friends. Kazuka refuses to just watch and proclaims that he will take his fear and fight in spite of it. Having his friends by his side reassures him more than anything, so they agree to protect everyone together. Ken realizes that he just said a bunch of corny stuff, but Kazuki assures him that it's exactly what he needed to hear. Afterwards, Ken hopes to forget his corny speech with some sleep, but Sujun appears to laugh at their bromance. Ken says that he's too tired to deal with her mockery, but she goes on to mock him even more. Ken knows that she followed Kazaka because she could tell that something was wrong, but she is glad to see that Ken took care of it. Ken admits that there is a part of him that doesn't want to fight, and Sujun wonders if he doesn't want her to fight either. Ken would rather she not, but he knows that she has already decided to live in this world. This is true, so she leaves, as they all have a big day tomorrow. The next day, the king makes his announcement. It's only a matter of time before the Demon Lord's army invades, so he plans to intercept them in the grasslands. Two years ago, they pushed back the Demon Lord's army, but he is sure that they have gotten stronger since then. It won't be easy, but he reminds everyone that they have gotten stronger as well. He points out that they have two heroes now, Kazuki and Suju. They also have the help of the rescue squad, which plays a critical role on the battlefield. The king concludes his speech by assuring them that they will win, and everyone gets hyped. Later, Kazuki goes to see Celia. He apologizes for coming unannounced, but she is actually glad. He confirms that they will be going into battle, so she prays for his safety. He swears to protect the country, but more importantly, he promises to come back to see her. The shop Celia hopes he will, and the two say goodbye. Elsewhere, Yururu over Blurin Ken lets her pet him, but warns that Blurin might not allow it. Yururu is certain that they would be the best of friends, but she is severely mistaken as Blurin slaps her hand away. Blurin keeps slapping her away, so she's glad to see that a little bunny has appeared to make her feel better. This girl just can't catch a break as Kakaru teams up with Blurin to push her away. Ken must then keep Olga from crushing himself to death, and they watch as Yururu continues to try and pet Blurin. Olga reveals that she's actually really nervous since it's her first time in battle. Her erratic behavior is just her way of hiding her anxiety. Ken's then called to go see Rose, but he just now realizes that he has never been to her room before. Ken fears that she has decided to torture him, but he arrives to find that she just wants to talk. She wants Ken to explain his role on the battlefield, so he says that it's to heal the injured with her on the front lines. That is only partly correct, as the beginning of the battle will be different. The other squad members will bring the wounded back to the rear, and they will treat them there along with Olga and Yururu. There won't be many wounded on the front lines at the start, so they would just be sitting ducks there. Furthermore, Rose tells them not to heal the wrong people on the front lines. Ken thinks that she means not to heal the enemy, but she calls him an idiot, as that's not what she means. There will be people who are injured but are still fighting. He shouldn't try to heal these people since he will just get in their way. It will be up to Ken to use his judgment to decide who to heal at a moment's notice. Ken completely understands, and Rose finally gives him his rescue squad uniform. It was designed this way because it was made to help them stand out on the battlefield. Our boy Ken couldn't be happier, so she told him to put it on. Rose is glad he put on so much muscle, since Ken is able to fill the suit up well because of it. Rose manhandles him once more to explain that healers are not immortal. Once they die, it's over. The one thing he can never do on the battlefield is take his life for granted. Ken explains that he obviously doesn't want to die, but this just makes Rose call him an idiot again. Tark is cheap, as Rose knows plenty of people who talk the way he does and died anyway. Being part of the rescue squad means that he must save himself too, so he shouldn't underestimate the value of his own life. Rose doesn't want to hear any self-sacrificing talk from him, and she promises to end his life before the enemy does. 
Ken hears her message loud and clear and confidently declares that he will save everyone, including himself. She questions if he can really do it, but he reminds Rose that she was the one who told him to speak his ideals. Ken thinks about the vision he saw and determines that it doesn't matter if it really is the future. He knows what he must do, and that is to not let Kazak or Sujun die, no matter what. I appreciate you viewing my anime recap, Unruly Family. Please let me know what you think about the wrong way to use healing magic by liking, sharing, subscribing and leaving a comment.